Hi, welcome to another MK Healthcare Business Consulting discussion. Nice to have you here. This is the second presentation in the productivity series. And today I'm talking about time management, balance, mentoring and performance. You can see on the first slide, there's a summary of this presentation. And there's a lot of detail that we're going to go into, but we'll start with talking about what urgent and important mean. And there's a very, very good model that Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, produced called The Time Management Matrix. So we'll show you that in a moment. I want to talk about how to use the time management matrix to assist you to perform better and to focus at difficult times, such as practice downtimes, accidents, or as we've all experienced, COVID-19 or other serious events that may happen within our lives. Talk about how to ensure you find the right mentors and understand how they will help you and what to look for. What working in an empowered environment means and how that will progress you. How to manage your performance, um, how to balance your life. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the habits of successful practitioners that we've learned from a number of years of dealing with practitioners in, in our, uh, our clinics and so on. And there's a, a, a piece of work that a, a man called Stephen Covey did some years ago called the Time Management Matrix. And this is about what is urgent and what is important. And again, going back to the four quadrant idea, the key quadrant we need to work in with our management of time is to be doing things that are important but not urgent. And what that means is if I'm, I'm planning is not urgent, but it's important, provided that I do it. Building relationships is important, but it's not urgent. The things that you can do not urgently, whereas answering the phone is an urgent activity, may or may not be important, you don't know. And again, you have the quadrant, just like you did with the productivity engagement example, of non-urgent, non-important, which are time-wasting, procrastinating activities. And it's not a place where you want to be. And the slide really illustrates some of the key cases with urgent and non-important as well, which are sort of interrupt, interruptions and, and doing mail and some of these other things. They become very urgent if you don't do them, but how important they are is, is, is a question. So one needs to be thinking about getting into this area whereby you're actually doing things that are important, but they're not urgent. They're not being forced upon you. They're things that you've planned to do. So planning is very important there. So the time management matrix gives us a framework to work for. And I think that it's really up to you to establish what is urgent and important for you. But I think as emphasised by the time management matrix, a lot of what we're talking about is being proactive and planning. And a lot of that fits into, into quadrant two in the time management matrix, particularly when we can be doing things that are important but not urgent, things that we can do in, in our time rather than time forced upon us. So performing in difficult times and focusing in difficult times is obviously a challenge to all of us. These will be moments of despair for you and your practice and your practice life as well. There may be times where you're doing better in your practice than other times and really analyze, trying to analyse those things and understanding when they're happening to you is really important. And I think the way, the path you should take is to focus on what you can do now. We get very much caught up in the idea of what's going to happen, what will be the situation in the future, and that takes us away from the present moment. And that's that really equates to the idea of what can I do right at this minute to make future moments better for me? And it's not an easy thing to do because we're very distracted. It's one of the principles of meditation, as many of you may have done or you may know. But being in the present moment sounds like a simple idea, but the many distractions from our thoughts and external activities and, and things that are happening around us take us away from being in the present moment. And these distractions, particularly things that we can't control, right, that are outside our control, tend to distract us when really we should be looking to work at how we can actually deal with the things that we can control and doing that in the present moment. So plan your time in the present moment. We talk a lot about planning in productivity, in the cases of productivity, and planning is really a crucial part of that. So don't catastrophize the future that all is lost, all is not lost. 
this too will pass, whatever the situation is, is a phrase I sometimes use. So don't catastrophize, oh my God, that's the end of my practice, or I'll never be able to build it up again, or whatever the case may be. So balance you and your first and primary role, which is you, and your practice, and your life. And I find a very good way to go about doing some of these things is to look at what your roles are. If you look at a circle with your role in the middle of that circle as being the most important, and then an outside circle that encompasses all the roles in your life as a clinician, as a mother, as a father, as a, as a partner, as a brother, as a friend, but also as an athlete, as an educator, as a teacher, as a mentor, all of these are roles and they all need to have time applied to them by you, by you working on them. But you cannot perform the roles in your life to any adequate way unless you actually have a sense of what you are and what your individual role was. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about life balance. So taking action and understanding what urgent and important mean for you is very important, as is the habit two of Covey's Seven Habits of Effective People. That is a book that I highly recommend to all of you. Is called Be Proactive Habit Two. And what that means is that if you actually divide stimulus and response and put them in two boxes slightly apart from one another, there's a space between those two. If we're at the animal kingdom, often instinctive behavior happens. A stimulus happens, a response happens immediately. We sometimes do this too in the fright or flight sort of processes. But really, in many instances, if there's a stimulus, external stimulus, what sits between the stimulus and response is what Covey called the power to choose. The power to choose your response. Stimulus happens. COVID-19 could be a good example. The response could be, oh my God, it's, it, it's disastrous. Whereas in the middle could be, I choose. I've now got time. In some professions, when these, when these events happen, they can't even work, so they've got time. They've got time to actually think and plan and do things that will be productive for them when they come out of that particular time of difficulty or stress. So always think about the space between the stimulus and response being the power to choose your response. How will you respond? Human beings are not animals. They have the power to do something when the stimulus happens. Often a lot of bad things that happen in life happen because people don't take this moment, this space to choose their response. So think about that as a concept as well, and that might help you to actually focus in some of the difficult times we're experiencing now, but also at other times in our lives. Planning. I talk a lot about planning with clinicians and practices, and I've done this in the practices that I've operated, but also others as well, because most people don't understand the importance of having a plan. A good example would be nobody builds a house without first having a floor plan or, or a structural plan about how they're going to build the house. If they don't have that plan and they just go ahead willy-nilly, the chances of that house working well or the plumbing being right or the electrics not being a problem is very limited. So if you think about that way, it's about planning not just your practice but planning your career. And that's a topic, really, we talk about at another time. So what method will you use to make your plan? What objectives will they be? Will they be clear and well understood by you? How are you going to structure your activity? How are you going to use your time? How are you going to use the, the downtime when you don't have patience to actually work on your plan or implement your plan rather than going on social media or wasting time um, gossiping or other activities? And what level of a commitment are you going to show to action? At the end of the day, execution is everything. So it's okay to have a plan, but then you've got to work out how you're going to execute that plan. What process will you follow? We talk about form and substance. Form is the way you do it, but substance is what you do. So it's all very well to be have a very good approach to how you do it, but if there's no substance to that, then it looks shallow and falls into the category I talked about of being productive yet not engaged. And that can be very very easily seen by a patient in your practice. The measures have got to be relevant to you. They've got to work for you. So will they be what referrers have you got? What 
dollars per hour are you generating? How many patients will you see? There's a number that they can be. And they really have to work for you in your practice. When will you set them? When will you review them? Once again, it's not a set and forget process. It's very important to make sure that when you create the actual measure that you then look at what the time's going to be before you review that measure again. We developed a a comprehensive document which was a planning tool called Achieving Your Career Objectives. And this was a document that went not just into what your clinical objectives are, but what your commercial objectives are, what, what levels of risk you need to deal with, what your objectives administratively are going to be. And that really comes down to managing your time with your files, your notes, and your referrers, and, and doing your letters and a whole range of activities that need to be done, how you'll go about doing them. And the final objective area we looked at was that of risk. How do you mitigate risk? Have you got your insurances up to date? Are you registered? Do you understand some of the policies around uh, sexual harassment, for example? Because that's really changed over the years to being a lot of things people wouldn't have thought thought about, particularly in the digital area with videos and, and comments and things that one person thinks may be appropriate, another would think are inappropriate. Finally, measuring and counting what you do is really one of the key eight habits of effective uh, therapists. Measuring and counting means not just how many patients you saw, but what types of patients you saw. And how often are you going to review those KPIs that you set for your performance before? So all those elements come into a comprehensive plan for your practice. So the slide about mentoring and implementing strategy, which is a behaviour change model, is rather complex, but I think we'll just go through it quickly to see that you get an understanding of it. So in your practice or in your practice that you own or in the businesses that you own, you need to get your strategy and systems as best as you possibly can. You need to have a clear outline of where you want to go and how you plan what you want your future to be. And there's systems around that. There's computer systems, there's reception systems, there's paperwork systems, there's filing systems, there's a whole range of systems we need to get right. So you as an individual need to work out what your strategy is and what systems will go around that, what software you're using, what programs you're using, time management and all these things are still systems. Next step for you is to then engage and sell the benefit. Features of whatever program you're looking at don't sell the benefit sells. It's all very well to have a car that's got a twin overhead cam, but what is the benefit of that? That's what ultimately sells at the end of the day. So you may be an excellent practitioner in the area of neck mobilisation, which is a feature of what we do. What is the benefit of that? The benefit of neck mobilisation is that people will have a looser neck, the muscles, the structures of the around the joint will be freer and the range of movement will improve. There's a simple example. So you need to make sure you understand that you need to sell the benefit. So you then have an implementation plan and you set goals. You've got a strategy. What's your plan? We talked about what I call the ACO. That will be your implementation plan, which got your objectives in it. Again, we'll talk a bit more about this a bit later, but then you need to collect data with your KPIs and you need to lead your practice, but lead yourself by example. What are you doing? when you accumulate measures of your performance to help that performance improve. And that will come from analysing data that you've got, from getting feedback that I talked about in our first presentation, to look at what your benchmarks might be for performance, not just you, but for your practice, and then to have people reviewing your performance. If you haven't got someone to do that, it's very difficult to be totally objective yourself. Now, all of the above then lead us to having improved strategy and improved systems and then it becomes a feedback loop as you can tell by the arrow that then gets us back to strategy and systems at the top. So I've mentioned mentoring in our previous conversations. I talked about getting a clinical and getting a commercial mentor. In this instance, we're going to talk about what the expectations are of your mentor. And we talked about some of the specific things, but how you engage with these mentors is is easily just as important. So we've talked about clinical and commercial. Credibility as a clinician is a given in our industries. So therefore, you need to have credibility as a clinician, and this is assisted by having both clinical and commercial goals with what you do. Respect comes from the development of trust. 
for you to trust your mentor and for your mentor to trust you, you need to actually have a degree of respect. That will come from a number of things. And the things I've highlighted particularly are meeting commitments. Not just your mentor, but you. If there's to be a mentoring session at 12 o'clock on a Tuesday, make sure you're ready for it. Make sure you're prepared. Even the extent of reminding your mentor, sending a message to your mentor, I guess, just confirming we're right for 12 o'clock today. It's no different to you having a relationship with a friend. If you constantly don't meet commitments, if you arrange to go to the movies and you pull out at the last minute or you're to meet somebody for a coffee and you don't turn up or you're half an hour late, it won't develop trust with that person. Second thing is to clarify the expectation. What does that mean? What that means is that the session we're having today is about knee mobilising techniques to improve knee extension. That's what you know you're going in to do. You can do your pre-work. Your mentor can prepare the ground for you to do that. Similarly, if there's a commercial mentor you're dealing with, today we're talking about crucial KPIs for you in your practice in terms of dollars per hour, dollars per patient, referrers, numbers of referrers, etc. You're talking about those things today, so you're both clear what you're going into the meeting for. You need to be both open and honest in your communication with your mentor as your mentor needs to be with you. Openness means being vulnerable at times, being saying, I don't understand what you're saying. I, I feel uncomfortable in this environment. I feel as though we're not getting what we need to get out of this. Are you happy with how this is going? Are you happy at the feedback that you're getting from me, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Meeting commitments might sound like a very simple thing to do, but just to highlight a couple of the points here, I've mentioned some of these. Walk your talk. Say, if you say you're going to do something, then do it. Be punctual. There's no good getting there half an hour late. If the clinician who's your mentor is having a session at 12 and he's got a patient booked in at 12, it's not going to happen. So make sure you're looking at that to be realistic. Have a consistency of message. Understand what you want to learn and the mentor should understand what is being taught. And performance is a similar matter. Make sure that you don't come along and have your session at the end of the day where you're tired and you can't be consistent because you're lacking energy at that time. The structure needs to be delivered by your mentor. They need to be very clear what the expectations are going to be over the next coming months as you're developing this. And look at developing how the process will work. Have an agenda. Have some plans. What tools will you need? It's no good having a session where you're going to be using certain pieces of exercise equipment if you're having that one-on-one session in a room with none of that equipment to demonstrate. So that's the same with the KPI tools. If you're going to be developing KPIs, you need to have your KPIs with you, not just say, oh, well, I think they say this or I think they say that. So that's a meeting of commitment from you but also from your mentor. And I think it's very important for your own improved productivity that there you follow these sorts of commitments. Clarifying expectation, again, sounds like a simple thing to do, but this is the key to communication. What do you expect of me the next session that we're doing? Or what can I expect of you? So make sure that you're asking these questions. If you've expected to have actually treated three patients who've got a particular type of problem, say a hamstring strain, you're talking about that next time, it may be that if, if, if you haven't managed to do that, you clarify, look, I haven't treated any of those people since we last met. Is that still appropriate for us to meet? The non-verbal as well as the verbal clues are important in terms of the development of trust. Repeat what you think was said. It's a key element to empathy anyway. This is often you or the mentor giving feedback So what I heard was uh, you talking about me to another person saying that, you know, I'm not making any progress. Well, rather than doing that, why don't you, you know, I heard you say this, could you please refer that directly to me? And this is really the, the major concept of reflecting feeling, is this is how you show empathy. Oh, what you're saying to me tells me that you're feeling stressed and uncomfortable with what we're doing at the moment. Oh, yes, that's right. That is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling sad because there was an episode in my family. Oh, you, you, so you actually had an episode of ill health in your family and that's creating you being sad and not as productive as you could be. I understand. These are ways of making sure the relationship with your mentor works as well as it possibly can. I'm going to talk about 
empowerment now, which has been a much overused word in many circumstances, but there are certain conditions you need for empowerment. And when I'm talking about empowerment, I'm talking about empowerment for you to do a better job in what you do, which will come to working in an empowerment environment, working in a situation where you feel empowered to achieve more with what you do. So really to work in this sort of environment or the conditions you need are trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is a concept that comes from someone's character that they demonstrate in their interactions with you of being honest and showing integrity and actually working with you, but also showing that they have degrees of competence by their experience, by the way they talk to you, by the techniques that they show you, by the patience that they've talked about what they've seen. Now, from this, these elements of character and competence will come the notion of trust, which is simply about of acting with integrity. We've talked about that, how you work with one another, where the honesty sits there. And in your case and in the mentor's case, seeking first to understand, then to be understood is a crucial element of that. The next part is about time and patience and support. Not everything can happen quickly, so it's realistic for you to be more productive, to do this in a staged fashion every quarter to have new things that you want to learn, not try and learn everything straight away. Accept the fact that it's going to take you maybe a year or two to improve your productivity. Obviously, hard work and persistence comes into that, and that's something that if you don't feel as though you're, you're that way programmed, it's an area you need to develop. You need to understand... I've got to work harder at this. I've got to get more help. I've got to read more. I've got to listen to more podcasts. I've got to go to more presentations, whatever the case may be. And the law of the farm is a simple concept where we all know that you just don't plant the seed and, and harvest the crop straight away. You need to actually choose the right ground to plant the seed. You need to prepare the ground. You need to have the right soil. You need to get the seed into the ground. You need to manage the weeds. You need to water it. You need to put fertilizer on it. You need it in a good place so that it gets the right level of sun for then the seed to germinate, grow, and then to be harvested. So the harvest comes after the work's been done. So think of the law of the farm as a metaphor for how you might go about some of the things that you do. So what is an empowering environment? What are the characteristics of such an environment that you can work in? Well, challenging and interesting work is always something that we'd like to see. What does that mean? It means having the types of patients you like to see. I've mentioned the ideal patient before. Is that the sort of patient that you're getting to see in this clinic? If your interest is in sport and you're working in a practice with a lot of older people, a lot of people that that, that are more infirm, maybe how you're going to go about getting the sorts of patients that you want to see. What new ideas can you introduce or are being shared with you in that environment? And is it developing you clinically and commercially? What are the opportunities for learning and growth? I'm talking about mentoring. I'm talking about education. I'm talking about teaching. Is that happening in the environment you work in? How can you make that happen for you? Or how can you make that happen for your practice or for the practice that employs other people? Education and mentoring needs to be structured. It's not something that just happens. There needs to be a plan. There needs to be a roster. There needs to be commitments made to make sure that those interactions we're talking about, both clinically and commercially, will happen. And do you have any control over the factors that enable high performance and continuous improvement? Is the clinic growing? Is the new equipment coming in? Is new ideas being shared? Are there new services being developed? Can you have any control over these? Can you say, well, look, it would be great to have more myotherapists working in our practice because the soft tissue work, we're not dedicated enough to do that. It would make the work we do with our low backs and our necks and our shoulders more efficient if we could do that in conjunction with a myotherapist if it's a physio practice. Or conversely, if it's a myotherapy practice, do we need an exercise physiologist to come in and run some of the class programs that we run? or get a Pilates trained therapist to come in and run Pilates exercise classes. Are these things starting to happen? And if it's not your practice, do you get the ability or do you have the ability to have a say? Are your ideas listened to? Is there a forum? Is there a a meeting structure where you are able to actually introduce your ideas or your thought and do they get support? Oh yeah, that's a good idea and then nothing happens. Oh no, Jeff came up with an idea last week and we've decided that we need another piece of Pilates equipment. 
Or Jeff came up with the idea now that with patients who are anxious, we need to have a, have a lighting dimmer in a room so that there's less harsh light for the patient. Do we have the right temperature control in the room where, where this is happening? Is it quiet where patients are able to have a better opportunity to, uh, to relax more? Because we know relaxed patients get a better response to the treatment that they get. So performance management is a, a key element of, of what we need to do. Some time ago, when I was having my performance managed by the, the guy I mentioned before who was the corporate consultant, he would always say to me, the performance management is about, about getting feedback, but more importantly, it's about improvement. In many ways, performance management should be called performance improvement because if you're not improving with what you do, your level of satisfaction is not very high. And we'll go into the different levels in a moment as to how you, how you look at improvement. So relationship development is obviously a key part of that. If you've got a developing relationship with those that are supporting and mentoring you, you're going to have better performance. Your performance is also going to be managed. But don't let it not happen. I hear stories of people saying, oh, well, I was supposed to have my review. I didn't have it. Or, yeah, they always talk about it and they give us a sheet of paper to fill in and we complete that, but then there's nobody sitting with you and giving feedback. If that's not happening, take, take proactive steps. You make sure you're getting someone to help you manage your performance. At the end of the day, it's the score that counts. If you actually look at it from the point of view of a, a game of sport, the performance would be measured by what the score was. Did we win? Yeah, we won. We got two, they got one, so we won. At the end of the day, there needs to be a scorecard. And this is where it comes down to the concept of developing relevant and effective uh, key performance indicators too. So you need to have set the plan up front and the objectives up front. So we'll talk about that when we talk about the achieving your career objectives. But really, part of the measures that you can introduce come around the idea of, of key performance indicators that are relevant to you. And we'll, we'll, we'll actually talk about that a lot more um, as we move forward. But the three areas of, of actually measuring your improvement come down to feedback assessment and review. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those now. So feedback is something you need to get or give often. It needs to be something that's, that's low level. It's always live in the first person. I like the way you talk to that patient would be good feedback. It should provide an observation, ideally factual and objective. And your mentor might say, I've noticed over the last couple of weeks that your management of your time has improved significantly. Your patients aren't waiting for as long as they were before and you seem to be getting very good results, patients are coming back to see you. It's factual, it's objective, and it's an observation that was made, and it's not judgmental. I always said that you want to get a response when, when you're giving feedback to somebody, and I always looked at the pathway of looking at what, how, to, how, how to start with a positive. So even if somebody was really not performing well and was really disengaged, I would always start with, I like the jumper you're wearing today, or those shoes you have on really, really suit the outfit you're wearing, or, you know, you're, you're always very um, well-groomed when you come into the practice. So there's always something you can start with that should be a positive, if you can possibly make it that way. The second level of actually managing performance is that of assessment. And this, as you can see from the slide, it's non-judgmental and it invites a response. It's a little bit more than feedback, because this is something that's a bit more formal. So if we were doing assessment, we'd say, okay, well, John, let's meet every, every quarter and every quarter we'll meet. And then that's the time to impart the details of a particular action that you've taken or, or those that are taking that was not appropriate or inappropriate. I think it's always good to make sure that these details are imparted, not as immediate feedback, oh, you did this badly or you did that badly in the feedback session. It would be over the last couple of weeks or months and even if there's a persistent behaviour, don't wait three months, get the feedback or give the feedback earlier than that in the assessment form. But it needs to be something that's not just an idle piece of feedback at a particular time. You should always try and offer suggestions or provide direction about what they could do. One way you could do to actually not be so, um, so late with your patients is to schedule a break in your diary every couple of hours of 20 minutes to enable you to catch up but also to run better on time could be a good example. 
Also, if there's a behaviour that's around um, idle use of time, introduce the person to a time management matrix. Or even if you're getting feedback that says you need something to assist that behaviour, get them resources, find an article or something that they could read or even provide a demonstration of the, of the desired action. So I usually go about doing this. I mentioned role play before, but role play becomes essential when you're actually looking at how you can assist people to improve. So as I said, at the last part of the slide, it says it's best to perform the assessment once you've noticed repeated behaviour after feedback provided without a change. You can't keep saying to somebody, Jack, you're never here on time. Jack, you're never here on time. So there needs to be something that says, okay, Jack, I've mentioned to you with brief feedback over the time that you're always late. Let's just sit down and work out, well, what's going on? Do we need to start your roster later? Do I need to start later because I'm having difficulty getting there by 11? Are there circumstances that prevent me from being on time? These are all part of being assessed and assessing. And the final third level of feedback assessment and review is review. And this is something that's very formal. It's often no more often than biannual or annual. It's a scheduled activity. Somebody knows every six months we have a, a formal review. This is when it's scheduled. This is the time it's going to be done. And usually there's some sort of, okay, well, look, here's something for you to fill in to complete, to give us an indication of what you're doing or we're going to be looking at your KPIs, which we've accumulated over the past month or the past year. We've got your review document that we'll be able to talk to with all of the measures that were in place for you. So this is a documented activity and notes will be made and notes will be kept by you and by whomever's doing the review. But this is a really important part of being more productive. And the measures can't just be quantitative. In other words, did your number of patients you saw in a week improve or do you have X referrers now where you had Y before? It will also be qualitative. I've noticed generally that you are a more positive influence around the practice now. It seems to me as though you're supporting younger people that are working here or you're keen to provide options for other people. You've I'd had some suggestions about how you might want to do education sessions, just things that indicate that there's a noticed change of behaviour. And the review will often be something that you'll sign off. So there'll be a sheet to say that this is the time and date that it happened with formal assessment written, and that becomes a permanent record. And even if you work in a practice on your own, trying to get feedback, you might even try and get this review done with you by a, 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 another senior member in your practice, or it might be done by someone who's your mentor. So if you run a practice on your own, you need to have an external mentor who you regularly relate to and meet with so that they are able to do the review for you because it's a crucial part of being more effective and being more productive. When we started this presentation, we talked about time management and I met, mentioned balance um, a couple of times. And I think the areas, again, I, I draw this work from um, Stephen Covey who, who talked about balance being in the realms of physical, in other words, what you what physically you do, social, emotional, about relationships, mental, what are you doing to improve your mental capability? And spiritual in the sense of what's the spark? So let's talk about those four things before we talk about some of the stories that might illustrate some of these points. So physical really is how you keep yourself in good health. It's about diet, it's about exercise. It's about making sure that you're doing things that will keep you healthy. If you're not eating properly and you're eating sporadically, do you need some vitamins to supplement what you do? If you can't exercise because you can't run from a sore knee, is there another way you can exercise? Could you ride a bike? Can you get five times of 30 minutes of moderate physical activity every week that will help you physically? That's the minimum guideline, but it's something you need to do to get the balance. And with all these elements of balance, it needs to be scheduled. So I know in my case, I get up every morning, I get on the bike, I've got some weights in the backyard. That's what I'm able to do five times a week. I don't do well in gyms, but that's what suits me. I'm motivated, I can get up and I can do that. I can't run because of my knee, I've got a bike. So that's what I do. It's a stationary bike. So I can listen to podcasts while I do that as well, if that's what I want to do. The socio 
emotional area is more about how you relate to people. Do you keep your commitments? Do, do you meet with your, your friends? Do you make time for your partner? Do you check in on your parents? Do you check in on those that are, that are struggling? How are you spreading your time, not just visiting people, but are you, are you having special time to go and do a movie? Are you having special time to go and have a meal? These things all come into how you look after yourself both socially and emotionally. The mental part of life balance is around what you're doing to further enhance your mental capacity. That's reading, that's listening to podcasts, it may be uh, listening to inspiring speeches. It, all these sorts of things, it, there's lots of options now, particularly when times are closed down, of, there's a webinar for just about everything that's available now and always will be, I think, after the events of COVID that'll be effective as well. But the mental aspect is something that you need. To look at how you can develop your brain. Reading books seems old-fashioned, but you really, if you're a reader, you need to, to look at how you might read 12 books a year or one a month or try and get to read a book every couple of weeks, just something to stimulate your mind. The last one of these four elements is that of spiritual. It's the spark. What's the spark? For you, it might be watching the sunset. For others, it might be having a religious observance. For others, it might be meditating. I've heard people say that their spiritual spark comes from playing golf. Well, that's fine because that's communing with nature in some ways and it's something that people can do. If it's being done with people, other people at the same time, it tends to be more social activity. Spiritual is something that you you can share but is, is often individual, is often a private time, something that you can do. And I think try and understand what is the spark? What's the little fire that lights you, that makes you feel good, that makes you um, develop yourself, that makes you feel as though you're, you're fully whole by doing. So some of the stories around these, there's one particular one that AW that I did some work with about <clears throat> his roles and the functions of, of what he did in his life. And he was doing up to 20 hours physical activity um, a week. He was neglecting his partner. He wasn't connecting with his parents at any time. He did very little socially because he was getting up before he went to work and riding for three hours. And I thought this was a gap in the other areas of his life. His role was way too focused and much too developed on the physical side of what he did. So we worked with him. He gradually got better balance with that and, and, and reconnected with some of the friends he'd let go. And I've mentioned this before, but this is really crucial about the need to make you your key role. Start with you. If you're not well, if you're not healthy, if you're not happy, if you're not stimulated, if you're not able to, to connect with the spark that drives you, you're not going to perform well in your role. If you can't perform well in your role, you're not going to be able to perform the role with other people, with your practice and balancing your life. So you really need to make sure it's you. It's not about selfishness. It's about making sure you understand that for you to, to actually service the roles in your life, you need to be well and happy and healthy as much as you can be. So We've talked a lot about management, we've talked a lot about balance, talked a little bit more about mentoring and getting in the right sort of environment that you need to work in. But now I want to talk about the eight habits of successful clinicians. Some years ago, when I started doing some work with a company called Life Care, they'd created what they called the eight habits of successful clinicians. I think these are worth going through because they encompass many of the areas of being productive that you could possibly address. Some of them relate to what you do when you're not treating patients, but others relate to how you operate in your practice. So the first of these conditions is the notion of never turning a patient away. What does that mean? What it means is if somebody comes along and they're a little bit late and you can still accommodate them, you're not going to turn them away. What I'm talking about is that if somebody rang up that's one of your regular patients and they rang up reception, and the reception said, oh, no, you can't see uh, Mary until next week. I've always instructed the practice receptionist who answers the phone, or if it's you, to actually say, look, I, I can see you at the end of, end of my session today. Um, I'll stay back. Um, 
I'll make sure that uh, I see you because it's urgent for you and it's important for you. So that way the patient is engendered immediately with a sense of, I really want to, I really need to be seen, but they're putting themselves out to see me. And when you put yourself out, there's always an advantage that comes back to you by doing that. We'll talk a little bit about reciprocity in the next presentation when we talk about techniques of persuasion. The next habit is really to have spots to grow. What does that mean? Having spots to grow means that you actually allocate specific times during the day whereby if the opportunity arises, you can get an extra patient or two, very similar to not turning a patient away. Seeing new patients the next day is really the concept around acute treatment. If someone comes in with an acute injury and you're going to leave them for a week, you don't know what's going to happen in that week. So it may not be the next day, but it certainly should be something you do very shortly afterwards, if possible. And even if they do need acute treatment and you're not there the next day, organise them somebody else to see. Intensive care means to actually not just provide the normal treatment you do, it actually goes the extra mile. It's ringing up a patient to see how they went, if they left you uh, with pain. It's actually making sure that they're communicating well with you on their exercises, they understand what they need to do. Also, it might be the idea of giving them an extra blanket or it might be a matter of making sure that the room temperature is the right temperature, etc., for you as well. Building trust with referrers is a key part of this as well. And we've talked a little bit about this, but we'll talk more in later presentations about how you go about developing these relationships and some of the laws of growth. We'll talk about that later. Count and measure what you do is also something we're going to talk about too because counting means how many patients you saw, what fees you generated. These are all part of being a productive clinician as well. Be reliable. Do what you say you will do. That's the fundamental tenet. So if you say you're going to ring somebody, ring them. If you say you're going to be there, be there. If, you, if your patients know you're there every afternoon to a certain time, make sure you are. Set their expectations. And this is really a key one too, so that when a patient leaves you, it may be worth mentioning, you may be a little bit sore after today's treatment. It's amazing how often that patient will come back and say, oh, you told me I'd be sore, and I was. Now, what does that mean? It means they've listened to what you've said. And rather than them panic because they're sore, or they may even be worse, it was something that they expected that would happen. Impressive service is really around the simple concept of, of actually making sure that every element of your practice works well. That you've got a friendly voice at the front of the phone when they answer, that they answer, identify themselves, the practice and provide a greeting, that your waiting room looks good and schmick. It's not covered in dust and dirty magazines and so on. And making sure that you're clean and hygienic, particularly in times whereby there's infection around, it's also important to make sure that the sheets are changed after every patient, that, that people understand that it's a sterile environment they're going into. Patient callback simply is a matter of getting back to the patient um, by saying, look, I'm going to call you, you're in pain, I want to see how you're going. Or if the patient rings up and says, I want to talk to Michael, but he's not available, that you make sure you get back to them in a prompt way. It's a bit like emails as well. How you use downtime is a key element of productivity. And spending time on Facebook has got its place, but you could be doing things with your plan to improve your plan. You could be doing things to make sure that your uh, referrers are being nurtured, that you're writing your letters, that your files are up to date. Similarly, transferring trust. What does transferring trust mean? Well, if you're not going to be at the practice, you're going away on leave or there's some reason you can't come, you're offering the patient the, to be treated by somebody else in the practice. Um, this therefore means you say to the patient, look, I'm going to get you to see uh, Michael tomorrow. I can't be here. You really do need treatment tomorrow. Michael's an experienced practitioner. You've noticed him working in the practice down there. I'll introduce you if you like, but it, you really do need to come in tomorrow because your condition warrants you having treatment tomorrow. Similarly, I'm going on leave while I'm on leave, you need to come into the practice once a week. You need to, to make sure that that condition continues to improve. So you make sure they know who they're seeing, they've been told about the practitioner that they're seeing and so on. 
Now, you might notice I've gone through many more than eight habits here. It's actually an idea of actually developing certain habits. So I've increased this from the eight, but originally the original document started with eight habits. And the final one I want to talk about is the notion of change the patient. What does that mean? What it means is that the worst thing that can happen with a consultation is for the patient to leave and say, well, what happened? I don't have a diagnosis. I've had, I don't feel any better. I don't feel any worse. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, whether I'm supposed to come in. I've got no exercises. They would be disillusioned and they're the patient that will often go and see another practitioner. In that case, you've effectively lost the patient. So make sure you're thinking about that. Even change the patient might be, I've given them a diagnosis, so they come in with more information. Or I haven't given them a diagnosis, but I've given them a differential diagnosis of a number of different problems that they might have. We need to see them again to assess what happens between now and then to, to try and hone that diagnosis. Or I might even tell them, look, I don't think I've, I've got an idea what's going on with you today. Um, and therefore, I'm going to refer you to see somebody else or you need to see a specialist or you need to have an x-ray. So they leave with better arm, with more knowledge. They understand their, that you're actually going to care for them, that you're going to provide different solutions to their problem. So I think that the whole concept of change the patient is very important as well. So I challenge you to think about this and develop your own habits, right? What are the habits that you can have that actually will enable you to be more productive in your practice and what you do. Uh, on the completion of, of the second one of our series on productivity, I've talked a little bit about the notions of time management and balance and how you go about using your time. And that really sets us up to go to the third session that we're going to conduct called Measuring Productivity and Setting Objectives, which is the third presentation that uh, you can move to. It's online or if you want to spend more time on the earlier presentations to prepare you for this, then you should go and do that again or maybe review those, those documents before you do. Thanks for listening today. Feel free to visit my website and sign up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me or send me a message on LinkedIn. Thank you.